Lexical semantics is a subfield of linguistic semantics. The units of analysis in lexical semantics are lexical units which include not only words but also subwords or subunits such as affixes and even compound words and phrases. Lexical units make up the catalogue of words in a language, the lexicon. Lexical semantics looks at how the meaning of the lexical units correlates with the structure of the language or syntax. This is referred to as syntax-semantic interface. The study of lexical semantics looks at the classification and decomposition of lexical items. The differences and similarities in lexical semantic structure cross-linguistically. The relationship of lexical meaning to sentence meaning and syntax. Lexical units, also referred to as syntactic atoms, can stand alone such as in the case of root words or parts of compound words or they necessarily attach to other units such as prefixes and suffixes. Do. The former are called free morphemes and the latter bound morphemes. They fall into a narrow range of meanings and can combine with each other to generate new meanings. Lexical relations. How meanings relate to each other. Lexical items contain information about category, form and meaning. The semantics related to these categories then relate to each lexical item in the lexicon. Lexical items can also be semantically classified based on whether their meanings have derived from single lexical units or from their surrounding environment. Lexical items participate in regular patterns of association with each other. Some relations between lexical items include hyponymy, hyponymy, synonymy and antonymy, as well as homonymy. Hyponymy and hyponymy Hyponymy and hyponymy refers to a relationship between a general term and the more specific terms that fall under the category of the general term. For example, the colors red, green, blue and yellow are hyponyms. They fall under the general term of color, which is the hyponym. Hyponyms and hyponyms can be described by using a taxonomy, as seen in the example. Synonymy Synonymy refers to words that are pronounced and spelled differently but contain the same meaning. Antonymy Antonymy refers to words that are related by having the opposite meanings to each other. There are three types of antonyms. Graded antonyms, complementary antonyms, and relational antonyms. Homonymy Homonymy refers to the relationship between verbs that are spelled or pronounced the same way but hold different meanings. Semantic networks Lexical semantics also explores whether the meaning of a lexical unit is established by looking at its neighborhood in the semantic net, or whether the meaning is already locally contained in the lexical unit. In English, WordNet is an example of a semantic network. It contains English words that are grouped into synsets. Some semantic relations between these synsets are moronymy, hyponymy, synonymy and antonymy. Semantic fields. How lexical items map onto concepts first proposed by Trier in the 1930s. Semantic field theory proposes that a group of words with interrelated meanings can be categorized under a larger conceptual domain. This entire entity is thereby known as a semantic field. The words boil, bake, fry, and roast, for example, would fall under the larger semantic category of cooking. Semantic field theory asserts that lexical meaning cannot be fully understood by looking at a word in isolation but by looking at a group of semantically related words. Semantic relations can refer to any relationship in meaning between lexemes, including synonymy, antonymy, hyponymy and hyponymy, converseness, and incompatibility. Semantic field theory does not have concrete guidelines that determine the extent of semantic relations between lexemes and the abstract validity of the theory is a subject of debate. Knowing the meaning of a lexical item therefore means knowing the semantic entailments the word brings with it. However, it is also possible to understand only one word of a semantic field without understanding other related words. Take, for example, a taxonomy of plants and animals. It is possible to understand the words rose and rabbit without knowing what a marigold or a muskrat is. 
This is applicable to colors as well, such as understanding the word red without knowing the meaning of scarlet. But understanding scarlet without knowing the meaning of red may be less likely. A semantic field can thus be very large or very small, depending on the level of contrast being made between lexical items. While cat and dog both fall under the larger semantic field of animal, including the breed of dog, like German Shepherd, would require contrasts between other breeds of dog, thus expanding the semantic field further. How lexical items map onto events Event structure is defined as the semantic relation of a verb and its syntactic properties. Event structure has three primary components. Primitive event type of the lexical item. Event composition rules. Mapping rules to lexical structure. Verbs can belong to one of three types. States, processes, or transitions. Defines the state of the door being closed, there is no opposition in this predicate, and both have predicates, showing transitions of the door going from being implicitly open to closed, gives the intransitive use of the verb close, with no explicit mention of the causa, but makes explicit mention of the agent involved in the action. Syntactic basis of event structure. A brief history generative semantics in the 1960s. The analysis of these different lexical units had a decisive role in the field of generative linguistics during the 1960s. The term generative was proposed by Noam Chomsky in his book Syntactic Structures published in 1957. The term generative linguistics was based on Chomsky's generative grammar, a linguistic theory that states systematic sets of rules can predict grammatical phrases within a natural language. Generative linguistics is also known as government binding theory. Generative linguists of the 1960s, including Noam Chomsky and Ernst von Glasersfeld, believed semantic relations between transitive verbs and intransitive verbs were tied to their independent syntactic organization. This meant that they saw a simple verb phrase as encompassing a more complex syntactic structure. Lexicalist theories in the 1980s Lexicalist theories became popular during the 1980s and emphasized that a word's internal structure was a question of morphology and not of syntax. Lexicalist theories emphasized that complex words have lexical entries that are derived from morphology, rather than resulting from overlapping syntactic and phonological properties, as generative linguistics predicts. The distinction between generative linguistics and lexicalist theories can be illustrated by considering the transformation of the word destroy to destruction. Generative linguistics theory states the transformation of destroy destruction as the nominal nom plus destroy, combined with phonological rules that produce the output destruction, views this transformation as independent of the morphology. Lexicalist theory sees destroy and destruction as having idiosyncratic lexical entries based on their differences in morphology, argues that each morpheme contributes specific meaning, states that the formation of the complex word destruction is accounted for by a set of lexical rules, which are different and independent from syntactic rules. A lexical entry lists the basic properties of either the whole word or the individual properties of the morphemes that make up the word itself. The properties of lexical items include their category selection, C selection, selectional properties, S selection, phonological properties, and features. The properties of lexical items are idiosyncratic, unpredictable, and contain specific information about the lexical items that they describe. The following is an example of a lexical entry for the verb put. Lexicalist theories state that a word's meaning is derived from its morphology or a speaker's lexicon, and not its syntax. The degree of morphology's influence on overall grammar remains controversial. Currently, the linguists that perceive one engine driving both morphological items and syntactic items are in the majority. Microsyntactic theories, 1990s to the present by the early 1990s. Chomsky's minimalist framework on language structure led to sophisticated probing techniques for investigating languages. 
These probing techniques analyzed negative data over prescriptive grammars, and because of Chomsky's proposed extended projection principle in 1986, probing techniques showed where specifiers of a sentence had moved to in order to fulfill the EPP. This allowed syntacticians to hypothesize that lexical items with complex syntactic features could select their own specifier element within a syntax tree construction. This brought the focus back on the syntax-lexical-semantics interface. However, syntacticians still sought to understand the relationship between complex verbs and their related syntactic structure, and to what degree the syntax was projected from the lexicon, as the lexicalist theories argued. In the mid-90s, linguists Heidi Harley, Samuel J. Kaiser, and Kenneth Hale addressed some of the implications posed by complex verbs and a lexically derived syntax. Their proposals indicated that the predicates cause and become, referred to as subunits within a verb phrase, acted as a lexical semantic template. Predicates are verbs and state or affirm something about the subject of the sentence or the argument of the sentence. For example, the predicates went and is here below affirm the argument of the subject and the state of the subject respectively. The subunits of verb phrases led to the argument structure or hypothesis and verb phrase hypothesis, both outlined below. The recursion found under the umbrella verb phrase, the VP shell, accommodated binary branching theory, another critical topic during the 1990s. Current theory recognizes the predicate in specifier position of a tree in intuitive, anti-causative verbs. All causative verbs is what selects the theta role conjoined with a particular verb. Hale and Kaiser 1990 Kenneth Hale and Samuel J. Kaiser introduced their thesis on lexical argument structure during the early 1990s. They argue that a predicate's argument structure is represented in the syntax and that the syntactic representation of the predicate is a lexical projection of its arguments. Thus, the structure of a predicate is strictly a lexical representation, where each phrasal head projects its argument onto a phrasal level within the syntax tree. The selection of this phrasal head is based on Chomsky's empty category principle. This lexical projection of the predicate's argument onto the syntactic structure is the foundation for the argument structure or hypothesis. This idea coincides with Chomsky's projection principle, because it forces a VP to be selected locally and be selected by a tense phrase. Based on the interaction between lexical properties, locality, and the properties of the EPP, Hale and Kaiser make the claim that the specifier position or a complement are the only two semantic relations that project a predicate's argument. In 2003, Hale and Kaiser put forward this hypothesis and argued that a lexical unit must have one or the other, specifier or complement, but cannot have both. Halley and Marantz 1993 Morris Halley and Alec Marantz introduced the notion of distributed morphology in 1993. This theory views the syntactic structure of words as a result of morphology and semantics instead of the morpho-semantic interface being predicted by the syntax. Essentially, the idea that under the extended projection principle there is a local boundary under which a special meaning occurs. This meaning can only occur if a head projecting morpheme is present within the local domain of the syntactic structure. The following is an example of the tree structure proposed by distributed morphology for the sentence, John's destroying the city. Destroy is the root, V1 represents verbalization, and D represents nominalization. Ramchan 2008 in her 2008 book, Verb Meaning in the Lexicon, a first phase syntax, linguist Gillian Ramchand acknowledges the roles of lexical entries in the selection of complex verbs and their arguments. First phase, syntax proposes that event structure and event participants are directly represented in the syntax by means of binary branching. 
This branching ensures that the specifier is the consistently subject. Even when investigating the projection of a complex verb's lexical entry and its corresponding syntactic construction, this generalization is also present in Ramchand's theory that the complement of a head for a complex verb phrase must co-describe the verb's event. Ramchand also introduced the concept of homomorphic unity, which refers to the structural synchronization between the head of a complex verb phrase and its complement.